Good afternoon or good morning for the people just based in the US. And welcome to this panel on the transfers um, organized by NOIP. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you um, the five panelists that are going to take part in our discussion today. I will start uh, first with um, Kate Ruan. Ruan, I hope that I'm pronouncing it well. Kate is a senior legislative counsel for the American Civ uh, Civil Liberties Union, uh, focusing on free speech, surveillance, privacy, and national security issues and protection. In that capacity, she directs her advocacy towards legislators and agencies to craft policy change that advance those interests. The next panelist um, that we have the honor to have today is Clara uh, Guerra. Uh, Clara is a senior consult consultant at the Portuguese DPA, where she works since uh, 97. She's a guest lecturer at the Data Protection, um, Protection uh, in the Faculty of Law of the Portuguese Catholic University. And she's also a member of the EDPB expert group on international transfer and BTLE, when I had the pleasure to work with her uh, several years ago and joined the two task force set up by the EDPB following the Schrems II judgment. We have a third panelist, uh, Gabriella Zanfir. Um, oh, i hearing my echo, is it normal? Yeah, I'm hearing myself. Uh, just for the tech guys, it's a little bit annoying, but it's going to be okay, I guess. Um, so Gabriella is working as a senior consultant for the Future of Privacy Forum. And she used to work at EDPS as well. And we were also colleagues a couple of years ago. Um, then next panelist, Max Schrems. Um, Max was, uh, is the founder of NOIB, as you know, and was a little bit involved in the Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 <laughs> judgments. It's no coincidence that is um, in the panel today, of course. Uh, and the last panelist that I would like to introduce is Benoit Van Asbroek, uh, lead of the IT and IP and media practice of the Bird and Bird law firm in Brussels. And again, I'm sorry, but I hear my echo, and I guess I will have to do... Ah, it's, be it's not better. Sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm just hearing myself, retrieving myself. It's a little bit tricky. <laughs> I was just trying to go on with that. Sorry about that. I would like to launch the discussion with the first question that I uh, hope uh, will be provocative um, to the first panelist, uh, Gabriella. I have an interesting question for you, and I would ask, ask you to have your views uh, on this. Uh, what is really new, according to you, between the Schrems 1 and the Schrems 2 judgment? Uh, do you think that is really reasonable to see the anxiety in the sector? Or do you, do you think that it's really coming as a surprise that uh, the Schrems 2 judgment is so uh, such an obstacle for the industry? Or is it not really surprising, according to you? And um, do you think that the mindset of anxiety is the right mindset to have um, facing Schrems 2? Uh, uh, thank you, Roman. And, uh, hello, everyone. Hello uh, to the attendees and to the fellow panelists. Uh, Roman, I think that's the easiest question about this judgment. So thank you so much for <laughs> asking that. Uh, and I say that because, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't really surprising, the big picture, at least. Um, whomever paid attention to the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, especially when it comes to access of government to personal data, and uh, especially after Article 8 of the EU Charter became applicable uh, with 2009, um, if you looked and read the case law, you would see that the court always um, is very protective uh, towards the rights of the individuals. And we've already seen an assessment of, of the very similar same situation in 2015 in Schrems 1, um, so I would say overall, it, it shouldn't have been very surprising, at least um, uh, uh, the part where the US uh, legal system was being assessed and the part where the adequacy um, was um, assessed. I would even say it was what, what was interesting to see was that to, to an extent, the court was um, uh, even uh, giving a bit more leeway this time because in the first judgment, you, you must well remember, the court brought into the discussion the essence of the um, uh, Article uh, 7 of the Charter and of Article 47, if I'm not mistaken. And this time, uh, the, the court um, went more to the proportionality and necessity analysis. So that, that was, um, you know, an, an interesting thing to see. 
so no, overall, not a huge surprise. The only thing that I want to mention before giving back the floor to you is that um, what I found um, to, to be surprising, and I'm still uh, wrapping my head around it, was the fact that the court um, heightened the level of protection that needs to be achieved in a third country to essentially equivalence, even for uh, those uh, safeguards in Article 46. So that was indeed something that um, I, I'm, um, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily expecting to see. And um, I, I'm still thinking about how that can actually be practical and be put in practice and how it, it goes into the system, um, the broader system. Thank you, Gabriela. I don't know if anyone wants to react on that. What is the difference between the Schrems 1 and the Schrems 2, if you see any? Uh, Max, maybe you have a view on that. I'm sure you have. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the one big difference um, that was oftentimes uh, kind of not probably on the picture uh, for, for everybody is um, that there was a slight difference in the factual um, summary of the Irish court. So in the first case, they just said blatantly, there's mass surveillance, that's it. And in the second case, there was the thing that they said that there's mass and indiscriminate processing of data. So all the data gets processed by being scanned, for example, in, in upstream, um, but not necessarily then kept. And that is a bit of a difference. And I think that also explains what Gabriela just mentioned, that they said, you know, it's still disproportionate under Article 7, but um, it's not a violation of the essence necessarily anymore. And I think that made a lot of sense that it was kind of expected from, from our side as well. Thank you. Maybe, Clara, do you want to add anything? Do you think it's uh, it a surprise to have a Schrems 2 or? Uh, no, because the Schrems 1 was a little bit uh, misunderstood by the relevant stakeholders, um, namely some DPAs, the, the, even the Commission, the European Commission, because they, they come with privacy shield with uh, very, uh, very little uh, difference from, from, private, from safe harbor. So uh, in that sense, um, it's not a surprise, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> but we, we hope not to have a Trams 3. <laughs> Let <me see. laughs> that's the whole topic of this panel. Yeah, uh, are we heading to a Trams yeah, 3, yeah. I guess? Yeah. Uh, Benoit or K um, yeah, Katie, yeah. do you want um, to add anything? There is um, a key difference between Trams 1 and Trams 2. In Trams 1, um, all the stakeholders were looking uh, to the EU Commission. Uh, to, to solve the issue, what they try to do in, with the privacy shield. And now um, they reverse completely the, the approach since uh, the burden for being compliant fully lies with the data exporters. So it's, it's a big difference, I think. It's true, yeah. true. Maybe, Katie, you want to add anything? Uh, I mean, just tagging on to what Benoit just said, I think another big difference between Trends 1 and Trends 2 is that there's been no grace period for the data exporters. Um, and I think that's that is true. And, and it was, um, that would lead me to the second question that I had, and it was a question for Max. How do you see compliance? And, and I have a little idea of what you think about it. How do you see the compliance with Schrems 2 uh, compared with the compliance with Schrems 1? Uh, how, does, how does the sector react? Uh, do you see any difference between Schrems 1 and Schrems 2? And do you see any effort to enforce Schrems 2 or at least to be a little bit more compliant after Schrems 2? Yeah, I think there is, there's a couple of points there. Um, I think what Benoit just mentioned before um, is, is pretty correct that the first time around there was just this understanding the Commission is going to take care of it, there's going to be some new deal. And, and um, what was mentioned by Katie just before as well, um, that um, they, the DPAs, in my understanding, unlawfully said that they're simply not going to enforce the judgment for a couple of months. Um, and that kind of gave this feeling that, you know, there's no imminent need for action. The commission obviously had that whole view that, that um, a lot of the industry, uh, I would not even say lawyers necessarily, but more like, you know, lobbyists in a way, um, promoted that um, the court actually hasn't really said what it said and that um, actually there wasn't really an issue with U.S. surveillance law. It, was, it should have just been mentioned in the decision and once the commission does that, we're all good and fine. And I think that whole um, perception was a bit different. And there was a lot of um, talk as well that um, the court kind of in a way didn't really understand it or didn't really want to say what it said. So I think um, that is now fundamentally different if there is a second case where even more explicitly, the court basically says the same things. And I think that is 
a bit the point where it cannot be that easily ignored anymore. Um, at the same time, I, I think on the reaction, what we still don't really see is, is serious uh, DPA enforcement so far, at least. Um, the Irish regulator were just, um, you know, having litigation there that they actually enforced the case. It's pending for seven and a half years now. And what they did is to pause the case instead of um, actually um, enforcing it and bringing their own kind of own violation thing, which is now stuck as well. And with the other regulators, there could have been a lot of DPA's action in the sense of, um, you know, sending out at least questionnaires to companies um, saying, you know, let's look at the top 100, you know, big data companies in our country. What are they really doing? Can we ask them, you know, even just superficial questions, which doesn't need a whole investigation or so. I think that is still a bit missing. And I think that which probably from a US perspective, we could also then talk about a bit is, is also not putting to leading to that much push in the US as I personally would have hoped for. Like my hope was that the US industry will just say, we really have a serious problem here and, and kind of run up to, to, to Capitol Hill. And um, that happens partly. I mean, there you will definitely hear more on that, I guess, from the SLU side. But um, there's still a bit of a perception that it's not going to be enforced that quickly. And there's still going to be a bit of a factual grace period. And I think um, that is that is a bit uh, a problem that we see here. So I think personally, if, if the question is if we need a Schrems 3, I hope we don't. Like I, I already find two things with my name on kind of weird. <laughs> but um, but um, the, the big question is if we actually enforce that now or if we're kind of sitting around and do the good old European privacy on paper approach, which um, I think we've, we've seen a lot of so far. So that's so far, I think, most of my thoughts on it. What I'm a bit, um, and I think we'll get to that anyways, what I'm a bit concerned is that we see, again, a lot of down-talking of the judgment in the sense of that there is, you know, in reality, a risk-based approach and we can find some supplementary measures which um, will, you know, remedy all the situations anyways. And there is a big issue that probably large parts of the um, industry side of this is, is, is trying to, again, find no real solutions to the problem. And the problem is really also that, uh, quite honestly, usually with Neuber, we try to have a solution for each issue. Like if we file a complaint, you usually try to say how to solve it. And here, the, the solution is political in, in, in the end. So, um, and and ignoring that will will probably just get us into a, hopefully not Shrem 3, but, you know, Smith 3 and 4 and 5 case probably of, of, of people that may bring these issues up again and again. Thank you, Max. And I, I would love to um, ask maybe to Benoit, what would be his reaction? Because obviously you are directly connected to your clients. Do you see a difference between Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 when it comes to compliance? Do you see your clients coming to you um, quicker or um, asking for solutions? Uh, what, do you, what are the efforts for compliance that you see uh, after Schrems 2? Yeah, I think that's a very valid question because indeed after Schrems 1, clients uh, observed that the enforcement was relatively limited. Uh, so in the first stage, they expected it would be the same with Schrems 2, but then they realized that they were much more at risk. And we received uh, significant requests from clients to, uh, to draft revised uh, SECs. And uh, so before any, all the, the different documents that had been issued by by the DPB um, and by the Commission, uh, we already drafted some supplementary um, articles uh, in order to address as much as possible um, the, the ruling of Schrems 2. So you can see the difference. And I would ask maybe Clara on the DPA side, do you see any difference uh, between Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 regarding Compliance and enforcement, because I just want to say that sometimes compliance and enforcement are two terms which are confused. And we could agree that enforcement and compliance is not always the same thing. So we would be all happy to see compliance first, because it would need that there would mean that we don't need enforcement, right? But do you see any difference between Schrems 1 and Schrems 2? Uh, in terms of compliance, I wouldn't say. <laughs> it seems that business as usual, so uh, I wouldn't say that there are uh, any significant changes. I didn't notice that uh, someone stopped by using uh, the US-based services as before. As in terms of enforcement, uh, I would like to make a disclaimer here because though I suppose DPAs in general now with Schrems 2, 
they got the message finally about enforcement, which was not so clear in the first time, because there were, okay, we cannot use safe harbor, then we use all the other uh, transfer tools to, to the US. Uh, and didn't didn't reflect on the on the the meaning of the judgment in the way that okay if this is not good for safe harbor this is not uh, good for the other uh, transfer tools as well. Now the court made it very clear, so the the DPAs uh, didn't have any 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 escape. But uh, in terms of enforcement here, it's important to say that the length of enforcement actions has nothing to do with transfer itself. We have a we are handling a new problem because GDPR is applicable almost for three years, two years and a half. And uh, we see that these transborder cases, because these transfer cases, most of them, they are transborder cases. And we are handling, we, we have a problem of, of the burdensome mechanism, of the lengthy mechanisms with the trans, in, in uh, solving transborder cases. And um, this is for other cases as well, but of course, transfers uh, are included in these in these uh, batch <laughs> cases. And we really, um, even if we are, we have already started enforcement actions, it will take too long to 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 be finally applicable. And if if they end like this, if if the the controllers don't go to the court, so you 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 can easily have two years before you have one. Uh, 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 one sanction applied, or uh, even if, if even if you take uh, a decision like uh, uh, suspending the data flow uh, as an urgent measure, it will be only for a limited time. So that, that's another problem we have with GDPR and we ha we have with transborder cases, not to be <laughs> solved here or discussed here, but it also has um, impact when it comes to transfers because they are transborder cases, most of them. Thank so you. enforcement will come, but not so quick as we would like to. Are you trying to say that a one-stop shop is not always very efficient? The, I, I didn't Are you trying it. to say that a one-stop shop is not always very efficient? No, it's, it's lengthy, it's a, it's, it's a fact. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's lengthy, it's burdensome, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's important, it's relevant, but... Um, Let's see. We we need more experience to to mm -hmm. to to draw conclusions, but um, uh, we already have some hints. <laughs> I may All say. All right. I would turn to the U.S. now and maybe ask um, Gabriela or Katie whether you see anxiety or more involvement from the e-sector to comply with claims too. Do you see any difference, uh, Katie? Do you can you observe anything on this side of the Atlantic? I, I think that. Um, I think that companies are very motivated to find a solution to, to the CJU decision in terms to um, the, the question is whether they are motivated enough to truly solve the problem or motivated just enough to accept a new adequacy decision in the bond. Um, and I think we're probably looking at more the latter, uh, but we're hoping that even if we do get the latter, we will have their help in addressing the former by pushing for more permanent and longer lasting and better privacy protection. I understand. Uh, and Gabriela, do you see anything special uh, in the US reacting to claims two more than claims e one maybe? Yeah, they, they, there's definitely um, a lot more anxiety uh, here in, in the business community. But also there is a lot of, well, not a lot of, but there is attention actually, and, and important attention in, in Congress. We had uh, a hearing uh, in the Senate Commerce Committee uh, at the end of uh, 2020 that was exactly on the effects of Schrems 2 and transatlantic data transfers. Uh, and I think that's uh, very relevant. I was hoping to see it sooner. So, you know, it took almost uh, half a year. Uh, but in the end, the message uh, got to uh, the Senate Commerce Committee, and, and hopefully, you know, this will have an impact uh, on several things, uh, like um, like a snowball here in the U.S. Um, also, in in respect to U.S. Uh, federal privacy law on the commercial side, which is also something that's missing here. Um, so I, I do see a difference, and, and businesses are indeed um, uh, more anxious than last time, uh, at least as far as I can tell. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, 
um, that, that's, um, that's what I'm seeing. Thank you. And of course, on this side of the Atlantic in the EU, we're trying to find solution. And it would be my next main question to Clara. Um, as you know, the Commission trying to find a way out or like to improve the SCC. Um, they were just drafted and issued in December. Um, we all, I guess, uh, have seen the joint EDPS and EDPB opinion on the SCC's uh, beginning of this month. Uh, Clara, what do you think of this SCC? Um, are they helping? Um, uh, are there an improvement? Um, do we see a solution there? Or do you think there should be more effort uh, put inside um, in, into this SCC to make it um, an, a useful tool for the industry? Yeah. Well, the SECs are very much welcome indeed. Uh, they are flexible in their systematics. They they, they have the much awaited multi multilateral um, uh, um, tool. They are uh, modernized, aligned with the GDPR and, and mindful of the, the judgment of the European courts. So in that sense, they are reinforced. They are, uh, uh, they are a good step in, 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 a, in a good direction, but uh, they won't solve our problems uh, because they can't. They can't solve our problems. Uh, it's worthwhile recalling that the court didn't invalidate the standard contractual clauses, but it stated their intrinsic uh, limitations because we are talking about a contract via V national legislation. So the contract will always be superseded, no matter you have the over the top standard contractual clauses, it will bump into international legislation. So. Uh, I, I dare to say that these standard contractual clauses, uh, with some improvements uh, recommended by the EDPB and the EDPS in, the, in their joint opinion, of course, but they will fit, I dare to say, a, a high number of, of, of countries of destination, so they are better, uh, but uh, they don't solve the problems to the data transfers regarding the data transfers to the US. Indeed, they are not a solution. And um, they won't make the data miraculous uh, flow freely as the business would like to. Uh, at the end, is like Marx has said, uh, this is a political, um, uh, it requires a political solution. Uh, if, uh, if both, both sides, both parties are, are, are um, wanted to, 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 to get this uh, done. Uh, but, um, the standard contractual clauses by themselves, uh, they are better, they are welcome, but they are not the solution, indeed. I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, for a Friday afternoon, it's like a bad note to end up. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, uh, it's not, it's maybe not good news, but they will still hope, I guess. Like, do, do you think that the DPA can, um, um, the DPA can also help the organization uh, beside the DPB guidelines? Do you think that DPAs can help uh, the organization to comply? The question is, um, there, there are here two questions, either to, to comply, even in the sense that you don't transfer the data in the end, because you can't uh, for some destinations. Uh, the, the role of the DPAs is, okay, supporting raising awareness, never ending raising awareness. Uh, it's also to, to give guidance, which it, it does mostly through the DPB, where all the DPAs are, are represented, all the, the economic, um, European economic area. Uh, but um, they cannot replace controllers in their own accountability uh, obligations. Uh, so um, I suppose it's more comfortable to to rely on the, the DPA to, to ask if, can we transfer the data, but that's not exactly the role of the DPA. What I think here in this context might be the most important role of the DPA is to even the scales, because what, what we have here, in fact, most of the cases for the US, we have the SMEs and even bigger companies, um, which are in principle technically controllers and the, the services, uh, the, the, the companies in the US are the processors of the data, but indeed these controllers do not decide, they do not, are in a, they are not in a position to give instructions to the processor. So 
one thing is the legal framework. The other thing is the is the law. Uh, it's the reality, I may say. It's reality. And and here, the unbalanced positions of the data controllers, uh, it's um, it has no parallel. So, the only thing I really think that the, the data protection authorities could indeed uh, be uh, supportive is to even discuss, is to uh, intervene not directly to to that company because that's that's not how it's solved, but to intervene in a way. Uh, that supports the controller's uh, position. This is a uh, David and a Goliath, and 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 David is not is not winning. Um, so I think that here um, it's the the intervention of GDPAs are more important in this sense of of supporting the action and strengthening the the the, the position of the controllers. But ultimately. It's up to each one to, to make the decisions whether to transfer or not. So our work has to be uh, before, I suppose, before and framed also by, by on, not only by the law, but also by a political solution. Because this is, otherwise this will be a dead end for some countries of destination. And um, DPAs don't like to say this. They, that's why they are always trying to find uh, additional solutions, trying to avoid this dead end. I'm very blunt in this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not so idealistic, but uh, I, I don't think that th th it has to be like this. So uh, indeed the solution, but the solution does not pass by the DPAs alone uh, or by the, the organizations alone, of course. Of course, thank you. And Max, what do you think about um, that, this positive note from <laughs> is it like a dead end or are the SCC somehow useful in your in your opinion? I think they are useful for a lot of situations. I think even for the US, there are not, not every US company is an electronic communication service provider and falls under these US surveillance laws. So there is still room for that. And what's interesting, especially when the Court of Justice came out, is I got calls like, you, you lost halfway. And I was like, no, no, we argued that the SEC should stay because in, in many cases they can compl comply. Um, exactly where they can, one thing that, that I, I would probably just ask Clara back right away is um, we thought about that with Noib a bit is the law also applies to the processor abroad. So theoretically, it would also be able uh, possible that a DPA just says, you know, we go after a processor that is active on the European market, like the American entity. So let's say in our case, Facebook Inc. in the US. Um, there is jurisdiction, at least from the European side. The question is enforcement and all of that, obviously. But that would be a possibility to, because right now, and, and I, I heard that argument, and, and I must admit that I agree with it, is that we're kind of going against a small company in Europe now that can't really, you know, change the situation anyways. While, for example, big corporations could partly change their operation, operating structure, like Microsoft did the Microsoft Germany thing, where basically they didn't have access to the data. And, and that could be an interesting avenue where kind of the, the procedure hits the person that can also actually change it, something about it. So I think that, I don't know if there are any thoughts on DPA side on that any, uh, so far. Uh, so far, it's still, uh, it's still uh, too soon, but uh, yes, I, at least I can give you my, my idea. I think you're right. Uh, GDPR allows also to, to, to go, um, to 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 go to handle the, or to sanction processors or to 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 enforce uh, to processors. So, but here it's always the liability. The controllers are key role, uh, key players in this. Uh, processors, it's uh, more like a um, reflexive uh, way. Uh, but there could be some cases, and and there are also uh, some cases where this could happen where. We find out that after all, there might be a joint controllership because uh, the, the the controllers, uh, the small companies, indeed, they have a very uh, decision, very small decision level uh, mm. decision making. So it's it's more, sometimes more up to the processor. So in that sense, processors could be joint controllers. Um, this would pose another kind of problems, uh, but right. uh, but still, uh, there's uh, a variety of avenues that we can we mm -hmm. we would explore. I suppose we would explore. Uh, I could partly even see them being um, controllers themselves under Article Twenty Eight Ten, in the sense of if, as a processor, you do stuff you were not instructed to do, you become yeah, a controller yeah, yeah. yourself. Exactly. And and exactly. somehow, 
I, we haven't really looked at that much. It's, it's one of the things that we had on the to-do list at night, but I, that when you just mentioned that part, which I totally agree that we kind of now have to look at who actually has the power to change things. Um, that, that is something that was always around in my head without having really looked at all the legal details yet. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I would like to ask to Benoit maybe also directly in contact with the clients. In your perspective, are the SCC somehow improving the situation or is it something, how is the sector receiving the SCC? Is it like an improvement, um, a nice way out or still not the solution? No, definitely. It's, I think it's the main tool because as we know, BCRs are very difficult to get. Uh, most of the DPAs are still understaffed and there are huge delay to get BCR approved. And on top of that, it's only intra-group, so it doesn't play with uh, subcontractors. Uh, but so SCC is definitely um, used as a broad massively by, by op economic operators. And one very positive element that the business has noticed uh, with this new proposed SCC is that the, the scenarios that are covered are broader than it was. So now we have SCC for processor to sub-processors and SCC for processor to control. And I think that's, that's a very good move um, for the time being. Um, stakeholders were obliged to try to transpose a controller to processor uh, SECs or controller to controller in situation which which were different. So I think that's that's quite positive. Okay, that's nice. I, I had a, also a question, a follow-up question on the SEC to Gabriella because I'm sure that she has a opinion on that. Uh, what about the scope of the SEC, the new SEC, Gabriella? What is what about this notion of transfer? Um, are we happy about it? Oh, now, now you're giving me the, the hardest question. Of I mean, course. I, I thought, you, you know, I, I was, <laughs> I, I, I got away easily. Um, it's, um, I actually found interesting and, and a very smart way out how the EDPB dealt with uh, the, the um, uh, scope of the SECs as put forward by the commission. And uh, just for our audience here, um, uh, the commission um, restricted the scope of the SECs uh, that um, you know could can only uh, well cannot be entered into by organizations uh, to which Article Three Two of the GDPR applies. So organizations that are um, uh, that fall under the extraterritorial effect of the GDPR, uh, considering that uh, even though they are outside of the um, EU. Uh, they are not, in fact, transferring data because the GDPR directly applies to them, or at least this was the implication by, um, you know, seeing the scope being restricted in that way. And um, the reality is that we don't have a definition of what an international data transfer is. We don't have a, a, that definition in the GDPR, and it has not been defined by the EDPB either. So it's actually... Um, it, it, and this is essential, you know, it, it, we need to know what we are talking about. And I have to say, uh, speaking of anxiety after uh, the Shrimps 2 decision, I was the most anxious person, I think, well, among them after the Shrimps 2 decision, because um, all of my family and friends are in Europe. I live in the US and I understand data protection law. I was reading the judgment and I, I, I was thinking, oh my God, I, I won't be able to communicate with my family and friends, you know, um, because I was, uh, I was understanding the kind of consequences the judgment might have. Uh, it, it, it didn't happen, you know, that uh, apocalypse of communications came, uh, fortunately for my personal situation. Um, but I think it's absolutely key to, to, to have a definition of what a, an international data transfer is. And we've been operating uh, with uh, the idea that um, the definition of a, of a transfer is actually very broad. Um, and when I say we, uh, Roma, Clara, I, I, I refer to uh, our experience, for some of us, former experience of, of regulators uh, and, and your experience now. And I, I know that this is, I've always looked at a, a transfer as being defined broadly. So um, I'm curious about uh, what are uh, the panel's view on that? What is a transfer? You know, how, how does Chapter 5 and Article 3.2 interact? 
We can maybe have. Uh, if I can add to... one thing, even in the other direction, uh, we talked a lot about, let's say, Microsoft's um, data center in Frankfurt, let's say, because if that still falls under FISA, which to my understanding it does, as long as there is access from the US, um, then um, that may even be a de facto transfer because you know basically the, the the data is then not secure there anymore or not at least subject to to European law only. So you can you know either have that idea of what the Commission put forward and going into one direction of what you know the mainstream view was of, of what data transfer is it, but you could even argue it in the other direction with reasonable arguments. And I'm I don't want to say that I'm fully convinced of that argument. Um, but but that's even more interesting if, as we simply don't have that definition, as you pointed out. And just uh, to add, I said that the EDPB dealt with it in a very smart way, saying that in the uh, draft opinion on the SECs, saying that, well, um, you should make clear that this scope is for the purposes of the SECs, the scope that you define. It's not, uh, it doesn't have any implications on the definitions of uh, the definition of what, what a transfer is. So I think yeah. that was a smart way to deal with it on, on Just the commission terms. can't, I mean, the commission can't rewrite the GDPR in, in, in a transfer mechanism, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a difficult way. And I remember that you shared your anxiety uh, six months ago, Gabriela, with, with us. I, I was hunting uh, Roma on all of yeah. our social We're media We're not going to be friends on Facebook anymore. Come on, you don't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> this is that what is true. Uh, we, and and Kate, Kate, did you, um, and I think it's an interesting question for you as well, because the SEC is basically a contract tool. It's a contractual instrument. And what is your opinion about this kind of solution, this contractual solution when it comes to US legislation on surveillance? It's, I guess the, the answer is quite obvious, but you might yeah, catch I, Yeah, um, I mean, it's not going to, no, no contract can agree um, not to agree with a lawful order of the US government. And, you know, FISA is currently the law of the land, EO 12, Executive Order 12333 is still the law of the land. Um, so I don't think that standard contractual clauses are going to be able to supersede those laws. It is, I guess, not really surprising. And then it would just uh, lead me to another question, which is the fourth main question that I would have to, um, to ask to Benoit, because we had like a hope with the SCCs and we might have another hope with another document that has been issued by the EDPB. The, this is the, um, as you know, the additional measure guidelines adopted by the EDPB in last November, if I remember well. Um, what do you think but of these uh, additional guidelines? Are they helpful for an industry, uh, less helpful than the SCC, or is it like a nice complementary tool for your clients? Well, as, as we know, the, the recommendation on additional measures um, lays down a six-step approach for data exporter to follow in order to comply with the requirements of the Schrems II judgment. Presumably, uh, the most demanding and risky steps are steps three and four, which require data exporter to assess the law or practice of the third country and check whether it ensures the effectiveness of the appropriate safeguards of the transfer tools and if necessary, to identify and adopt supplementary measures that are necessary to bring the level of protection of the transfer data up to the EU standards. The recommendation on essential guarantees is deemed to help in carrying out step three, namely assessing the law and practice of the third countries. Looking at both recommendations, I would say that the standards are set quite high and compliance will require some real artwork from the stakeholders. Apart from the question whether it is des desirable to have such high standards, uh, which is more a political question, I believe that we can say that compliance will most likely increase costs, whereas, whereas some data exporters lack both resource and expertise for carrying those assessments. So we should forget, we shouldn't forget that. All data exporters, such as, for example, SMEs, have not in-house privacy and compliance team um, to, to afford for these uh, investments. And I think one interesting point is whether this, the Court of Justice or the DPAs will apply here the proportionality principle. 
in other words, whether SMEs will need to achieve the same level of assessment as GAFAM. And if not, uh, we could end up with a positive discrimination for SMEs that could create competition distortions. At the same time, I, I don't believe the recommendation did a great job at reducing uh, the level of legal certainty. Um, both recommendations are extremely technical and sometimes vague and not user friendly. It is very much possible that different data exporters uh, will come up with different analyses about the law and practice of a third country and will consider different supplementary measures uh, required. Moreover, such exercise is a never ending uh, story since legislation and case law evolved on a constant basis. Also, we should not forget that these assessments are not necessarily risk-free since the recommendations explicitly confirm that the data exporters may else be accountable for the decision that they take and therefore be li possibly liable uh, for absence of compliance with the requirements detailed in the recommendations. In, in other words, if the data controlled has performed such assessments in good faith, but if the DPA would have a diverging opinion in, on the assessment made, the control is subject to fines. And I think that this risk is not theoretical at all. Um, to give you an example, uh, the Belgian DPA has recently ordered a significant fine against Google in a RTBF matter, although Google had made a thorough assessment on whether the, the, the content should be blocked or not. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a genuine risk. Um, and even if we accept that it's now a given that simply signing transfer SECs is no longer sufficient and efforts will need to be made by the data exporter, I believe the EDPB could have gone further in creating legal certainty and finding a more user-friendly and pragmatic solution. For example, by carrying out some of the third country law assessment by themselves. Uh, we could argue that the legis European legislator or the supervisory authorities are much more better placed to carry out these assessments. In any event, the, the EU Commission is performing these tasks in the, in the context of issuing adequacy decision. The EU Commission should be more transparent, I think, in the pending assessments on whether a specific country is eligible or not for an adequacy decision. There is a real legal uncertainty on whether a country can, notwithstanding that it has not been credited by an adequacy decision, be nevertheless eligible for data transfer pursuant to the prerequisite of friends true. Moreover, um, why imposing to all controllers that are considering exporting data to proceed to a similar exercise, uh, if it would have been done by uh, the EU authorities, at least we would have one reliable exercise here. Everybody is supposed to do exactly the same exercise. So I think uh, that uh, this would be um, against the EU principle of good administration. And uh, it could be, I think, advocated that the absence of legal certainty for controllers could be construed as an invalid restriction of the fundamental right of conduct business, since such restriction uh, needs to be precise and foreseeable and enshrined in law based on uh, Strasbourg and, and Luxembourg case law. This could give room, I think, for challenging the validity of such approach. And so why not a Schrems tree? Uh, ruling. Um, it's interesting to notice uh, that the recommendation on essential guarantee claims to have taken into account all the relevant fundamental rights uh, at stake, but has fully omitted Article 16 of the Charter, i.e. freedom to conduct business. So I think the what I would conclude is that if data exporters don't see where to begin in trying to be compliant, they will most likely, for business purposes, prefer taking a risk-based a risk approach. 
which will not help, I think, unfortunately, the ultimate goal of enhancing the protection of personal data transfer to third countries. Thank you. Very interesting insight, uh, Benoit. And I will directly turn to Clara for maybe a first reaction of what uh, Benoit explained about the EDPB guidelines. You might have a, a different opinion, or maybe to share the opinion uh, about what to think about the guidelines, of course. And if I may, um, just maybe to have a provocative, provocative question, uh, I understand that the role of the DPA is quite of to be like really distance themselves from any direct involvement in the assessment of the third country legislation. But don't you think that when it comes to BC, BCR, for example, when they, all the information are handed over to the DPAs about the transfer, about the name of the company, the countries when the data are transferred, is it not the role of the DPA to say whether some of the countries where the BCR allow the transfer is okay? Or should the DPA still say it's up to the controller to determine whether the third country legislation is um, up to the standard of the EU law. Uh, just it, it was just a side question for you, yeah. of course. Like, yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, this is not only a matter of the country of destination or the national legislation of a country, because you always have to take into consideration the context, specific context of the transfer itself. Some legislation applies to some sectors, and they, they do, do not apply to other sectors. So. Uh, there is no one catch-all uh, <laughs> assessment for all uh, data transfers. Uh, and as even pointed out by, by Benoit, uh, even a country with uh, an old adequacy decision uh, that didn't, uh, didn't have uh, into consideration the, 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 the recent uh, case law, uh, may not bring the certainty or may not be the, the, a valid instrument uh, for certain kind of, of, of transfer. So there's a huge, uh, a, a huge world here. Um, I understand the criticism that the, the recommendations are technical, uh, but they try to be technical because uh, precisely um, because in being technical, they don't... Um, they don't um, give so much uh, legal uncertainty, but uh, there is no no one one answer that fits them all. The controllers, this is GDPR in general risk assessment. What you pointed out, Benoit, uh, as legal uncertainty for for the transfers, you can you can uh, transpose to any other uh, data processing within the EU that the data controller makes an assessment and the DPA may disagree when they are handling a complaint and they see. And the question here is that if, if you, in the best of your ability, you are able to show that you design the policy, that, that you put in place measures that correspond to an assessment, even if that assessment is, ends up being different from the DPA, but at least you have to demonstrate what you have done uh, in, in, of course, in, uh, in, uh, in good faith and, 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 and reasonable according to the, to the legal requirements. But there's a situation where you can have in any, any, anything. The, the data controllers, GDPR, they, GDPR eradicated completely any prior control, almost any prior control that the directive uh, allowed, the previous directive. So, uh, what what we have here is on on the accountability, full on the accountability of the organisations, and in the end, you can always have different approaches, different assessments from the DPA, uh, and sanctions. There could be sanctions, but there there are other corrective measures beyond sanctions. It's it's also important to see, and I think that we all have good sense and and reasonable and reasonable are reasonable in order to assess a specific case and where uh, such um, uh, such sanction is is due but um, uh, the the essential guarantees document is a document only based on case law so it's it's a kind of sum up and and systematization uh, it has nothing new in itself it's just to organize the ideas because we don't expect you say it's very technical i agree but uh, it's as much technical as a judgment. It's uh, it's it's the same. We 
we it's it's very complicated when you try to to put it in a very very friendly way of conveying and then the, you you miss the nuances and <laughs> there's a lot of discussion around it so it's better to stick sometimes to stick to the to stick to the to the to the wording original wording but i understand in the supplementary measures uh okay they were subject to public consultation there were like 200 contributions they are being handled uh we all hope that uh, they they help to improve the final outcome of the recommendation so because it was not the final text but again, these are not solutions in themselves. These, these are uh, solutions for some situations, but they are not, they might not be solutions for all the situations. So um, as to the DPB or the DPAs make the, their own assessments, I, I completely disagree. I think that we, we cannot confuse the roles and we want lawyers to have work <laughs> after all <laughs> but uh, i understand i i completely i'm joking but i completely understand that the the small companies uh they really are not in a position to make this assessment if we are going to make this assessment if we were going to make this assessment even for bcrs you would if you now you are waiting for uh, during two years for approval of BCRs, you would be waiting for three or four years. <laughs> if we had to assess all all the uh, all the, the the legislation in in third countries, um, it's important. It's um, this is all a process. You 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 we we understand that the Commission is very um, eager to uh, speed up some adequacy decisions and to explore worldwide. Uh, also with the interest of the countries, uh, uh, possibilities of, of having adequacy decisions. This might be, this might be uh, a way out. Uh, we should bear in mind that, um, and yesterday was the, the Data Protection Day uh, worldwide. And we, if we look back 10 years ago, uh, the, 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 the scenario is completely different now. There are a lot of countries with data protection laws. Uh, there are with, with data protection authorities outside the, 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 the European, outside Europe, and even, uh, of course, in Asia, in Africa, in, 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 in uh, Latin America. The situation is completely different. So international standards, data protection international standards, they are indeed spreading out. And, and this is good. This is good for data flows. This is good for economy. And, and if GDPR uh, comes to see the um, being a referential, uh, a referential and just that, uh, great. Uh, so we, we will be all in the, the same uh, level and, and this would also speed up some adequacy decisions and in some way to take some obstacles uh, out of the way. Uh, so we, we should also, Keep in mind uh, a broader, uh, a broader uh, perspective. Though we know that we are always very focused on the US because it's the major internet companies and and the services we use in Europe. But uh, there's more landscape, and and uh, if you can't find an immediate solution in one way, maybe you can find an immediate solution in other in a, in other alternatives while you work to have a solution uh, the most. Uh, broader as possible so um so, and talking about can... the sorry max maybe you wanted to, because i wanted to jump on the u.s uh topic maybe to ask a last question if if i may just to uh, maybe ask um katie or maybe we can come back to you after max what do you prefer you want to intervene now just one quick thing because i think these supplementary measures are are quite a, a topic um and and if I, i'm just going to try to to keep that short i think what people have to realize it's the it, the 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 default rule is data does not go outside of the EU. That's the rule since 1995. And you may disagree with that, but that's fundamentally kind of what it is. Um, and I also want to say that there are reasons to probably disagree with that. But then you have basically the SSCs as the first exemption, and then you have the exemption to the exemption, which is the supplementary measures. <laughs> so it's kind of already, you know, the third layer of trying to somehow get data out of the EU. And, and, and that is inherently going to be complicated and, and will just fit very little situations that, that and it's, and I think the hope of a bit of the industry was 
that there is now the magic solution that you just plug into the SSCs and everything is suddenly working. And, and I think that that is realistically not going to be there in this inherently by, by how the idea of supplementary measure even works will usually not be available to the average little company that just has a newsletter or something like that. So I think we just have to be realistic of, of where that could in, in reality help. But where I would totally join is, is the idea of assessing countries together. It's, it's absurd to have thousands of companies paying for a lawyer to do the same thing. I'm, I'm just not sure if it's necessarily the commission or the EDPB's job. I could see it there politically. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. But in reality, it's probably easier to, to get the lobby organizations off the business industry that you know usually walks around Brussels a lot and tells how they understand all the business needs all the time. <laughs> I was wondering why they haven't come up with these summaries so far and, and helped their members or the general public to do that because we as Lloyd even thought about doing that to a certain extent. <laughs> and it's you know by no means really what, what, what our donations are here for uh, primarily. Um, so I don't know if there are any thoughts in that direction. But it's interesting because talking about the assessment of other legislation um, uh, and, and, and Clara, you were mentioning the US because it's where everything began after all, right? <laughs> I would like to ask, I would like to ask Katie, uh, what should we expect from the US side, uh, especially with the new administration? Uh, is it wishful thinking to expect any change in the US regarding the protection of data or especially this new privacy legislation? Are, and especially data coming from the EU or other countries. Um, is there any hope there? Um... Uh, okay, yeah. I, I mean, so thank you, Ronan. The short answer to your question, I think, is yes. I believe we should expect a change in the US regarding the protection of data, particularly data coming from the EU. I would note that the US remains one of the few countries not to have um, general data protection rules for consumer privacy uh, right now. So we're hoping to see changes to that too in the upcoming Congress. But the big the big question I think with respect to Schrems too is whether the changes we'll see in US law will be sufficient to satisfy this EU. We face uh, political, structural and practical realities in the US that will make achieving the changes that the ACLU believes are necessary pretty much an uphill climb. Nonetheless, we do think there could be opportunities to improve privacy protection for everyone in the US and outside it, including in the EU, uh, for data transfers to the United States. And as Gabriella mentioned earlier, Congress has been paying attention to this, we did hold a hearing late last year, and we hope they'll continue uh, to focus on it. But just to unpack that a bit, since I know not everybody is you know, paying attention to every single little bit of US law, Substantively, the EU raised you know, two major concerns with U.S. law. Section 72 of FISA and executive, and executive Order 12 triple three, saying that the scope of surveillance under both of those authorities is too broad and that there is insufficient ability for individuals to obtain redress for when they're injured. Now, there are numerous ideas out there for how to address those problems. The ACLU has its own ideas. I think that a number of other panelists in the course of this of, of this conference have offered their ideas, and I'm more than happy to talk about them in more detail, especially the ACLU's. Uh, but first, I think it's helpful to understand that there are kind of two main decision makers with authority to make changes to respond to Schrems II. They are the President of the United States, now President Joseph Biden, and Congress. And to the extent that the president is operating within his executive powers as president or within the statutory authority provided to him by Congress, the president can make decisions unilaterally. That is, he can reach an agreement with the EU to make changes to U.S. law will attempt to address the concerns articulated by the CJEU. And there are, to be quite frank, strategic benefits to proceeding this way because there is a degree of certainty in dealing with just one negotiating partner. The president can agree to make changes and there will be no need to go to the Congress and risk that the Congress then makes changes to the actions the, the president agreed to, necessitating you know, more negotiation. Um, furthermore, the president can make significant and positive changes to address the CJEU's concerns about the scope of surveillance in particular. That's because the president doesn't have to use all the authority he is granted. So he can direct his intelligence agencies to narrow surveillance to only include, for instance, targets that met objective criteria, like they are a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. The president can also make other positive changes to narrow the scope of surveillance in ways that would alleviate some of the CJEU's concerns. And that would be a big step in the right direction, 
but it would not get us all the way there because there would still be the matter of remedies and redress that would need to be addressed in order to satisfy the CJEU. The ACLU believes that in order to satisfy the CJEU's opinion, people should have standing to challenge overreaching surveillance and they should be able to question the validity of the, those authorities themselves rather than simply whether existing procedures were followed. Currently, neither FISA nor Executive Order 12333 permit any individual, whether a U.S. citizen or not, to do that meaningfully. And the president can't create that authority on his own. Sorry. Yeah, we hear you. We're good. Uh, very, yeah, very. Um, but like as folks may be aware, getting legislation through Congress can be extraordinarily difficult, even on a good day. And on this issue, we face practical hurdles, including first and foremost, that FISA 702 doesn't expire for another two years. Um, and as an unwritten rule, Congress never really addresses anything until the very last minute. Furthermore, EO 12333 isn't an act of Congress at all. Uh, so, and another hurdle that we face is a lack of broad understanding by members of Congress of this issue and how important and urgent it is. So for that reason, we're a bit concerned that the U.S. will find it easier to attempt to implement these changes as a matter of unilateral executive branch action rather than going through Congress. And if the executive branch attempts to address remedies unilaterally, it'll likely do, more, do little more than strengthen the ombudsman and create a foreign intelligence surveillance support review for whether decisions complied with their own orders. And that approach just won't satisfy the, the CJEU because it's gonna to fail to establish a sufficiently independent fact finder, will fail to create binding remedies for EO 12 triple three surveillance, and will fail to permit fundamental legal challenges to the validity of US government surveillance. But uh, as I think I mentioned at the top, I don't think hope is lost. There are upcoming, upcoming opportunities for legislative reform. Um, last year, Congress allowed one of the big authorities under FISA to expire, including the provision that permitted the surveillance disclosed by Edward Snowden. And it's our belief that the intelligence community is going to seek to reinstate those authorities. So with concerns about TREMS 2, data localization and data transfers also being a live issue, we believe that Congress should include changes to address both the scope of surveillance and redress concerns raised by the CJU in any, in any future legislative surveillance discussion. And we know that there, ha that there is likely to be one upcoming. So that's, that's kind of where things stand right now. We're, we're hopeful, but we understand that there, that there is risk that the executive branch will proceed unilaterally and possibly not engage in all of the reforms that we think are necessary to address the CJU decision. Very interesting. Thank you, Katie. It's really insightful to know what would be the solution on the other side of the Atlantic as well, because we always, you know, discuss what we could do in the EU, but I think uh, what we can do with the US is also interesting to hear. Um, and I would like maybe to ask, um, Gabriela, would just make this big, you know, crossing the bridge between the EU and the US um, in the last years. Uh, what do you think about um, the situation in the US? Um, do you see also hope? Uh, do you think there is conciliation possible between the EU and the US in this respect? Um, I, I do see hope, um, but I have to say the situation is very complicated. Uh, and, and Katie just uh, painted a, a good picture of the moving pieces. Um, I, I would highlight that, you know, one of the points is that U.S. citizens want right now have um, the, the type of protections and, and the type of uh, redress that uh, the EU is looking for its citizens and residents. So I, I would say it, it's just very complicated. But hope, yes, I do have hope. Um, and especially with the new administration, uh, clearly this is top of mind for the new administration because we've seen an appointment the first uh, day, like the, the inauguration day of Joe Biden as president, we've seen an appointment uh, for someone, um, Chris Hoff, to take on this issue on the side of the Department of Commerce. And that's a part of it. And then, of course, we'll need to see what happens on the other part, you know, on the national security part um, as well. But uh, that's a clear sign of, of a will to engage for me. And it's a clear sign that um, the new administration is aware uh, the transatlantic data transfers are actually a, a big issue uh, right now. Thank you, Gabriela. If I we, I see that we have still 10 minutes remaining and I would like to maybe to take the opportunity to have at least one or two questions from the Q&A's that I just can see on the, 
on the panel, if I may. And the main one, that, because it's also popping up all the time, and I think it was also popping up yesterday during the other panel, we had two questions on our risk-based approach. And, you know, it's really the best word, I think, for transfer uh, that we just saw a couple of times uh, in this discussion. Yeah, we have five minutes less, apparently. So I would like maybe to, uh, to ask Max, uh, what do you think about this risk-based approach? And most of all, do we all speak about the same thing when you say risk-based approach? Because I'm not sure that everybody's on the same page um, regarding this term. Yeah, I think, I mean, basically uh, my take on it is, is very simple. There are certain parts where it's basically a security issue or an Article 32 issue. Um, when you say, you know, international um, transfers are hacked somehow, and there is a risk-based approach on that side of the GDPR. However, there is no general risk-based approach in, in the GDPR in itself. And I think that is a bit um, one of these, uh, you know, kind of uh, bullshit bingo arguments that goes around of, of just making up another element of the GDPR, which at least in any text that I know of is not there. And there are parts in the GDPR that are legitimately um, based on a risk-based approach, but data transfers in, in, in the elements I see are not. And, and I think that, that kind of answers probably that to a large extent. Um, it, there could be an argument for it, obviously, but but uh, I just don't see it supported by the law as it is right now. Interesting. And then I would like maybe to ask Benoit, maybe you share this opinion. Do you see a risk-based approach or such an approach um, that could be followed by the sector in the GDPR to assess the transfer? And just to use this, I guess you've seen it as well, this uh, risk-based, this uh, transfer risk-based approach that some people are just um, suggesting in the market. But, well, to be a bit provocative, I would say that GDPR compliance is nothing else than permanent risk-based approach. It started already with the GDPR compliance program that had to be initiated by the business. Um, companies made um, mapping of the, of the processing of data and gap analysis, and then they decide what what will they remediate uh, on the different gap analysis and companies tend to make a kind of hierarchy what really needs to be remediated what is a nice to have um, and, and that's based that there you start already with a risk approach because in practice you are not fully compliant but uh, you since this is costly uh, so companies also are planning to remediate not everything immediately, but uh, to put that on a five year or two years or one year plan. And, and with the transfer of data, it's exactly the same. Because if you're bound by contracts and that some of your service provider have the data localized of the, of, to the states, you cannot remediate that immediately. And I would like also to, to because we focus on the states, but a lot of company also have IT outsourcing services in India, and India doesn't benefit from mm -hmm. from an adequacy decision. So this risk-based approach is is extremely uh, key, and uh, you company do not have the choice. Yeah, so I think hope there's there's is, I think there's one fundamental good. difference if we say that on the material law level we already have a risk-based approach, which means to a certain extent I simply by law don't have to comply, and I'm still compliant. Um, is a different thing than what you describe right now, which is more the enforcement likeliness based approach, if I may reformulate it that way. And, and, and I think that's more of a, of a problem than a solution in the end. Thank you. I, I think we have two minutes left. So I would like just to maybe ask another question that I saw from the Q&A, maybe to Clara very quickly. We have one minute. So very quickly, that's a rush to the Friday. It's very nice. A lot of pressure. I saw a question about what about these data we are not leaving the US, the, the US soul, but are just, you know, hosted by US provider like Microsoft and Amazon still in the EU. Are we still in the transfer? Should I worry? Um, that's a recurrent question. You know, when you use like this CNIL affair with the he health platform in France, for example, what about the data not leaving the EU and but still hosted by US provider? Do we do we have a likelihood of access? What this do you think is about? for me? Yeah, sorry, Clara. Yeah. Ah, sorry, okay. what's there? sorry to surprise you. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, no, yes, in this case, it depends um, beyond the, the, the establishment where the establishment is. It depends if, if it's oh, uh, subject to the legislation of uh, the 
the homeland. Uh, so the, 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 the problems uh, might, uh, might be the same as if uh, it was sent to the US or if, if the, the data is still accessible or, or if the company in the EU is subject to provide the data to, to, to comply with some subpoenas, it's, it's, it's the same, the problems are the same. Uh, so they would not be secure. Okay, sorry, sorry, Clara, because I just got the message that we have to wrap up the session and I'm sorry for about this very last minute question, but I thought it was very interesting to address it. Uh, it was a really intense panel for sure, especially on a Friday afternoon or morning for the other guys uh, on the, in the US. Thank you a lot for um, your participation. And I think we still have a lot to discuss maybe for next year. Uh, and we will see whether, whether next year we will have a Schrems 3, who knows, maybe a trilogy. <laughs> 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 I see Max is very keen to have that. Uh, I wish you a lovely weekend and let's continue the discussion on Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, I guess, and see you next year. I hope live in Brussels. Thank you yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.